So we started not so much in television research, but in market research back in 1923. And throughout the years, we've had a lot of innovation. We do scanning of homes and of products. Um, 1950, we started with uh, television ratings. And last year, we introduced the first social media ratings with um, Twitter. So we continue to evolve our company along the timeline. So essentially, we are a survey research or a market research company, and our primary business is providing insight to our customers about their own consumers. And so that is essentially what we do. We divide our business into what people watch and what people buy. What people watch can be on television, it can be on their PC, it can be on their mobile devices, it can be anywhere. What people buy is either because we're supporting product, consumer packaged goods, we're supporting advertisers, we're supporting information about what you bought because you bring it home and you scan it for us. So we have a wide variety of products. Essentially what we are all about is collecting data, processing that data, and reporting that data to provide those consumer insights. Um, I'll just give you a couple slides. We're not going to go into a lot of detail about this because we're going to focus on project. But we talk about understanding viewer behavior. Again, I mentioned TV, online, mobile. You can see the kind of scale that we have here. 290 million panels, 500,000 consumers around the world. We measure a lot of data points. Talk about big data. We have a lot of big data that we're involved in. From a shopper behavior, we're very interested in what households do. We're interested in the demographics. We report it at a national level, a regional level, a country level. All kinds of data that we're producing. Retail spending, same thing. We talked about scanning products. Um, we actually have a classification of the retail universe in 100 countries globally. Uh, we're visiting over a million stores. So you get the scale of the uh, type of information that we're looking at. Um, this app I thought might be interesting to all of you. It's one of our newest introductions. It's actually a product that um, you, can, you can have access to. It's a free app on the App Store. Um, most of you raised your hand when I said, who knows Nielsen, because you've heard about it from television. Typically, if you work at Nielsen, the first question people ask you is, What's the top 10 program? What's the number one program? And we say we have no idea. But now we have an app. And you can go out and you can download this app. And you can find out information on TV, books, magazines, products, games, music. Everything is out there. It's free. You can download it to your iPad. And you can kind of keep in touch with what's happening in the world. This last slide here I thought was particularly important because I'll talk in a minute on our timeline. These are the values for our company. Open, simple, and integrated. That's it, those three simple words. And the reason I think they're important is because I think that the Microsoft Project solution actually helps to reinforce each one of these values. So open, sharing ideas and learning from each other. Simple, streamlining and improving processes. So having consistency and making sure people understand what your processes are. And integrated, working as a team across boundaries. So we're global. And all of our teams operate in the same way, using the same processes and the same tools now. And so EPM, as we call it, is the tool that helps us to support those values. So let's now talk about our route. Um, I think it's very important to understand where we started. Uh, I mentioned already that we've been a company in existence for 90 years. We started in 1923. Um, but in about 2005 or six we were actually purchased by new ownership. And at the time, the, they were a private equity team, and they looked at our company and they said, you know, a lot of really great individual businesses, but you're not acting as an integrated company. And so you know what? There's a lot more value if we integrate and you become the Nielsen company. You become Nielsen. And so at that time, we, we had the new ownership, we had those new values, and they implemented an operational aspect of our company called Global Business Services. And that was truly uh, one of the reasons that we've been able to make this product work so well in our company is because we had that central foundation for consistent process and operational um, components to our company. Um, so we started in 2009. And well before Deb and I got started, there was a group in our company that 
introduced a pilot for EPM. And we're going to talk on the next slide about what we learned with their pilot. Uh, there were some goodnesses, and there were certainly some not so good things that we learned, and I'll share that in a minute. Um, at the same time that that pilot was underway, we had the PMO, the enterprise PMO that was part of global business services that kicked off. And I know it made the slide pretty busy, but in the lower left, you can actually see our original uh, sort of mission statement for the PMO. And most of these items on here are actually aspects that uh, EPM actually helped us to support. You know, one tool to manage our projects in our uh, portfolio, financial and capacity controls, uh, one delivery process, so it's not so much our SDLC, but we're supporting our SDLC in the tool. And then certainly improving the competency of our PMs. Those were all our key goals back in 2009, and we've actually been able to make significant progress in all of them. So we first started, um, and again, I'll talk about the pilot, but we started with the um, launch of Project Server, and we did it in North America, and then we continued to deploy that around the globe. Then we said, well, let's go ahead and do Portfolio Server. And remember, at the time, there were two different tools, right? So we had the continued deployment of Project Server around the globe, and we deployed uh, Portfolio Server. Um, we've continued on our journey. Uh, one thing I forgot to mention, metrics and compliance were very important. You know, we're talking about a global footprint, and I didn't give any of the metrics, but we have about 4,300 users, about 1,000 or so active projects, about 350 project managers. Um, resources are total about 4,400, if I didn't mention that. Um, we are on-premise with what we're doing. Um, so when we started to launch, we fairly quickly, even though we didn't originally plan to do this, we realized that we needed to develop metrics because people had heard what we wanted them to do. We had our training. We rolled everything out, process and tool together. But the reality is when you roll it out there, then you need to know are they doing it. And so we quickly, with UMT's help, we got these metrics created that we launch every week. And we started to keep an eye on what was happening. And we knew where we needed to go back and refocus our team. Um, then we started looking at uh, Project Server 2010, right? Because two tools, it wasn't the most convenient. There were some challenges there in keeping the data synchronized. There were some performance challenges for us. And so we said, we don't want to live in that world very long, so let's go to 2010. So we started with the planning of that in um, 2011. And by 2012, early in April, we actually had launched it. And uh, so now everyone was using Project Server 2010. We right now are actually working on 2013. We're going to deploy it to our um, current technology and engineering team by about June. And we're also getting ready to launch it for our operations team. So that's kind of a new avenue for us. A different area of our business is to have operations team into uh, EPM in addition to engineering and technology. Before I go off this slide, are there any questions so I can keep going? But yes? Yes, we're staying. So the question is on premise versus online for 2013. We, first of all, we did a, a proof of concept for 2013 um, on-premise. Uh, we are continuing right now to move in that direction. We are interested in going online for a lot of good reasons. Um, but right now, we have a lot of customization. So I don't really have a slide in here. But one thing I would say is if you can avoid customizations, avoid customizations for a lot of reasons. Um, every time you upgrade, you have to think about them. You have to do something with them. And certainly, if you want to go online, you need to think about how you're going to satisfy them. Um, in our case, we, we pushed a good bit on some of the customizations, but we weren't able to eliminate all of them. So because of that, we're going to, in the second half of the year, go back and reevaluate online and see if we can uh, get there. But right now, we're deploying to 13 first. Yes? I think we actually have a little bit in here. We have, um, Andy can jump in here. We have uh, project metrics, like are you publishing your project? Uh, we have resource metrics, like how far out are you um, assigning resources to your project? You know, at a minimum we want, ideally we'd like the full project, but at a minimum we want the next month or two of the resources added in there. We have financial metrics. Um, Andy, I don't know if you want to add anything.
So the question was, are the metrics automated? And basically, they're running weekly. They're being pulled out of um, project, and they're put in Excel formats that are distributed. They're published on our SharePoint site, and then they're distributed for the governance leads, we call them, to monitor that data and make sure their team is staying within compliance. Yes? The biggest drivers to drive us towards this tool? Mm -hmm. so, so from 7 to 10, it's because we had two tools and that was challenging, right? It's basically two different set of applications that you're managing, two different sets of data. We were trying to keep that data consistent and that wasn't a space we wanted to be in. So that's why we went to 10. And for 13, there are new features such as allowing our CTO to approve timesheets on his iPad all the way through to performance and, you know, potentially some other benefits. You're welcome. Any other question? Yeah. So in our company, timesheet compliance is not really an option. Um, our timesheets, again, they're being used for engineering and um, technology, and they are being used to feed to accounting for the project financial CapEx process. And so if you want your numbers correct on your project, and maybe you as a team member don't really care, but the reality is the boss cares and the PM cares because they're going to be called about it. So um, that's the driver. Uh, we actually, it's not in here, but one of the things we did um, we talked about PM competencies. We actually ended up creating a whole series of five different um, interactive uh, project management financial trainings to help our team understand the importance of having accurate costs for their project and how their work in EPM fed that. So I would say, yes, you're always going to have the person who doesn't want to do it. Um, have someone who owns the governance of it in the local business teams and then give them the data to help them monitor it. At the end of the day, if they don't do it, their numbers are going to be wrong and they're going to not be satisfying their financial targets. You know, we don't use it for release management and um, since I'm now also responsible for some program release management, I'm probably interested in that, so I'd love to talk to you after about that. I saw there's some, I saw there's some kind of session about it, so maybe I'll see you there. Um, we, okay, any other questions and I'll, I'll scoot. Okay, um, so I talked about the pilot. So it was our corporate platform team that recognized the need to take these 35 different uh, businesses and make sure that we had visibility into all of the resources, all the projects, et cetera. Um, their intent was good, but their execution was not so good. And so what they did is they found two groups of about 600 people who were willing to participate, and they pretty much quickly got them into the tool. They didn't plan the architecture. They didn't plan any enterprise process. They didn't plan how they were going to support that team. And so while we were off on the side in the PMO working on an enterprise solution, uh, that started to blow up. And that's when Deb first got involved, and that's how we got UMT involved, because we thought we just needed to go in and train people, because we didn't really know what had happened. And the reality is there was a lot more to it. So the lessons learned here is don't just implement the tool without thought behind your process. Don't try to implement it if you don't have the right talent, the right skill, because you need help to do it well, and you will do it much faster if you do it with the right talent. And you know, don't forget to think about the architecture. Think about what your ultimate scale is. You might have only started with 500 people, but if you're planning to go to 5,000, think about that up front, because otherwise you're going to get yourself in trouble. Um, so hopefully I've covered most of those things. Uh, the other big thing is engage the users. Uh, that wasn't done so well with the pilot. Uh, they talked to him a couple times, but then they just went behind and, and did the configuration, and then they gave it to the team. And so not so much the right way to do it. So hopefully none of those look like things that you guys were thinking about doing, but definitely pay attention to the process, pay attention to the architecture, and make sure you have the right talent on your team to do it well. Um, 
So I mentioned we were working on the enterprise solution. What were our overall objectives? We wanted to find one solution, one tool that would help us to manage our projects, manage our portfolio. We wanted to make sure that we were improving our execution. Uh, we have a term called say do. It's a very important term in our company so that when you say you're going to deliver a project on such and such a date, we actually measure you as a project manager. Our goal was to improve that say do metric and get first time right delivery done at a higher rate. Um, and then we wanted to be able to communicate, so whether it's portfolio scorecards, project status reports, we wanted to do that consistently. We wanted to do it in a way that people knew and understood around the globe. So um, you can see, uh, I think one of the interesting things in the detail, the tool consolidation, when we first uh, took the team over, there were 30 different time tracking tools being used by our country, our company. Um, obviously, that was not the right way to do things. We also probably had at least 30 different ways that those project financials were being fed to accounting. And so we needed to simplify that and streamline it. One of the other things that really helped our company um, our CIO at the time was very interested in this project. He wanted to make sure that he could find his resources, find his projects. Our CFO was also a sponsor in that he wanted us to move to that one global process for feeding project financials. So if you can get those senior level folks um, supporting you and supporting your effort, I think your chances of success will be higher. Um, just a little bit about our footprint, and actually these numbers are old. We just did some new metrics, and we're actually like in 54 countries now. Um, we do have a lot of applications. Um, all that data is being supported in our tool. Um, and as I mentioned, our goal was to have the integrated uh, Nielsen company being supported out of one set of uh, applications. OK, process. Um, certainly, even with 2007, we were talking about process. And one of the things that I've, I've gathered, and I don't know for a fact, but we seem to use an awful lot of the set of um, processes that are available within the tool at Nielsen. We are using um, you know, project schedules. We are using resource management. We are using timesheets. They're all tied together. We're doing reporting. Um, we're using a lot of the functionality. The one thing that we're probably not as focused on is portfolio selection. Not because we wouldn't like it to be, but our company and our management team wasn't quite ready to do that. They have their own way they do things. And so that may come. We kind of hope it will come. Our operations team, where Deb is working with them right now, they're actually moving in that direction. But other than that, we pretty much use the full set of functionality available within the tool. What was really important is as we thought about moving to 2010, we had to think about how the different processes in project server and portfolio server were going to marry and be intertwined and how we were going to successfully deliver upon that. So again, I would say the key thing is don't forget to think about your process. It's really important um, when you even roll out the tool, it's not just rolling out the tool to your users, it's why and what's the process behind it so that they're going to begin to understand. Um, the little graphic on the left hand side is just an example of a workflow. We actually have um, portfolio governance in the tool and our uh, graphics here from Project Essentials are now 360. Um, we're showing you know where we stand in that stage and we actually record different metadata at different stages in the project. Any questions? Yes. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I would say as high as you can go. So in our case, I, I mentioned when we took, um, when we started down our transformation into the integrated Nielsen, everybody had their own process for managing people and projects, et cetera. Even when we tried to find our people, we couldn't find them, right? And we were also at the same time uh, moving to the use of an external vendor for a lot of our development. And so there was a lot of churn in that resource pool. So it was really, really important to our CIO that we were able to get a handle on our, our people. And you know, your people are your biggest expense, right? And so in our company, we had SAP for the full-time employees. And then we had you know, the other huge percentage that were consultants. 
and nowhere did we have everybody in one spot. And so by being able to put those into the tool, that was really impactful and helpful for them to be able to see the distribution of people by team, by business. Um, and so that was a, a driver for our CIO. Um, I'm trying to think back. So one of the things, not only did he want this tool and support it, um, he had some demands on what it did, but he was also a strong uh, proponent of it. So for instance, at town halls, he got up and he told the team when we were getting ready to roll it out, it wasn't just the PMO pushing it on everybody. It was this guy, Andrew, saying, this is coming. This is really important for our company, and you're all going to get ready to use it. So it's really nice to have that kind of support and endorsement when you know not everybody wants what you're about to deliver. Um, and like I said, the CFO, we didn't actually plan that. We knew we were going to be able to feed project financials, but we didn't, at least I'll speak for myself, I don't think we understood exactly the benefit that could be to our company. And so we kind of brought him in um, maybe close to the first implementation. And as soon as this guy was involved, it was like, okay, aha, now we've got it. And so he actually dictated, you know, uh, like the resource rates that we put into our system were global footprint. So what kind of rates were we going to put in? He told everybody, you're going to use these rates, you know, a blended rate by country. Finance will provide those. And all you other countries, you're not going to do your own thing anymore. You're going to use the one way to get the project financials in. So the higher you can go and you can help them understand the benefit, I think the better it'll be. So the timesheets are, and Andy's going to jump in if I steer wrong, but basically the timesheets, we, we call it like above the line and below the line. Above the line are the tasks that are provided to that team member by the project manager in their schedule. The tasks below the line are the administrative tasks that we defined as the standard for the company. And even that in a global footprint was not easy because the terms and the definitions around the globe uh, we're not consistent. So we had to work with HR and get agreement on that. And we have, you know, good training that we explain what goes below the line. So I don't know, does that answer your question? No, not yet. Okay. Um, training, just some experience on what we did and discovered in doing training. Um, the first thing is you have to figure out what kind of training for whom, right? So we did role-based training. We focused much more heavily on the project manager. Um, if you think about a global footprint, not everybody is quite as familiar with Microsoft Project. Uh, maybe that's changing, but you know, four or five years ago, at least in our company, the, the project manager in Vietnam, as our CIO used to talk to us about, he may or she may not have been as familiar with Microsoft Project Pro. And so we had to think about how we were going to bring them up to speed. Um, one of the things we did, and I don't have it in here, but we actually started our deployment in North America so that we could communicate more easily, we could validate our training, see if it made sense, see if people understood the process. So we rolled out first to North America, and then as we learned from that and we adopted um, our training and our approach, then we rolled out to the global teams. Um, but focusing on the project manager, really, really important, because even some of the basics, they, they may not understand. Um, so we developed not only training, but we also validated that training. So there were a few cases where they had to actually take this training and they had to take a little, I don't want to call it a test, but a, a knowledge assessment at the end so that we could confirm that they got the basics so that they could be successful. And the way we sold it is we wanted them to be successful, right? We weren't trying to set anybody up to fail. We wanted them to be successful. And the other, the other uh, sort of linchpin that we had is that we didn't actually um, uh, deliver the license for Microsoft Project Pro until the project manager completed that training. So we have a way to track it and we didn't give them their license unless they actually took the training. Sure. Did, 
No. So we, um, first of all, from a language pack, even in the tool, we only deployed English. Um, the training itself was also developed in English, but what we did do is we created what we call deployment coordinators. Uh, actually, I have it at the bottom here. Each business unit had a deployment coordinator. So regardless of where you were around the globe, there was someone in that business who was our key spokesperson to help us spread the word, answer questions within that business unit. Um, we also tried to make sure that those folks would be on the phone when we did training so that if there were questions they had in their own language that we either couldn't understand or we couldn't translate the answer, they would actually help us. But those deployment coordinators who understood the language in the local area were really essential to us. I don't know, did I answer your question? Um, it was a little bit by leader in technology, but those also tend to fall within regions. So more like uh, sort of LATAM, um, Europe, et cetera. Yeah, so we, so the question was how do we actually deliver the training? That was um, an interesting thing for us at the beginning because I think we thought we'd be able to, you know, go into a room and have people come in and talk to them and let them sit at a PC and learn things. but. You know, we had this thing called money that didn't allow for that. So we did everything virtually. We did everything through link or live meeting. Um, and it, it had its challenges, but that's pretty much how we did it. That was why it was even more important for us to have those assessments of the training so that we could be sure they, they understood it. Yes? Our original training was all developed by UMT. It was also delivered by UMT. Now we had somebody from our own team who was partner to that so that they could review it, understand it, make sure it made sense to Nielsen. It also included all of our Nielsen processes. So we had our own sort of core team on the project review that training. Um, but it was all pretty much a series of PowerPoint training along with demo in the online or live sessions. And then we had quick reference cards um, where we'd like to go. One of the, it's not in here, but one of the lessons that we learned is those training decks are great when you're first starting, right? They're 45 pages and they have every bit of material. So they're great for the initial. But the reality is people go back to their desk and they want to know how to answer that one daggone question. And so they have to try to figure out which deck, which slide, and it was not good. So we. On our support site for SharePoint, we actually had some FAQs and you know, frequently asked questions. But one of the things that we have on our list that we haven't gotten to yet is to do some short little snippet videos to say, this is the topic, here's how you do it. So if you've done it, good for you. We didn't get there yet, but it's on our list. We did both. Sometimes, I'm trying to remember, we did both. You know, generally, we would start at a higher level. You know, here's the process, and here's what we're going to do, and maybe some timing. And then um, we would have some slides on how, but first we would show them how. But then the slides in the deck would reinforce the how. So we kind of did a little bit of everything. Um, let's see. The other thing on deployment globally is don't take it for granted. You have to really have someone who owns that and who thinks about how you're going to do it and who works with the business side to make sure that you're going to do it at the right time, that you're working with the right players, et cetera. So in our case, uh, we, we worked with the technology leaders. We told them how much time it was going to take. Uh, we talked to them about our timeline of doing North America first. Um, we also had to pay attention to what was going on in their business, right? So. In North America, when it's Olympics, you don't want to touch the, uh, the media team, right? Because they're very busy on Super Bowl and Olympics. And you know, we just had to pay attention to what was going on in the business and not just tell them, this is the date we picked, we're going at this date. So don't forget to think about the impact on the user side as far as what you're going to deploy and when. Um, anything else on the training? Um, support and adoption, we've tried to do a lot, knowing that people you know, need time to absorb everything that you've told them and to, to get their compliance and adoption up. So initially, like the first two weeks, 
we did a lot, especially for the PMs, to make ourselves available to them. We couldn't be there in their room or in their company or you know, their location, but we were on the phone ready for them. We also scheduled daily lunch and learn so that we could bring you know, questions we were hearing that were kind of foremost in everyone's mind or so we could open it up to say, what's not working or what don't you understand, what can we help with? And so it was kind of open mic night and they could come and they could talk to us. Um, we talked about quick reference cards. We created a SharePoint site. The SharePoint site during deployment would show a team when they were going to be deployed, what the timing was. We put all of our training out there. So it was kind of like one focal spot where they could go to find out what was going to happen with this big deployment for them. Um, we talked about the metrics. There we go, project management, resource management, and time shoot. We've already covered that, so we're probably good in that regard. Uh, the last thing about the metrics, though, the metrics are not just made available to the PMs because you pretty much could guess what would happen. They're very busy. If you mail them out weekly metrics, they're just going to like put it in file 13. Um, so you need to find the people who care about the quality of that data and make sure that they're monitoring it for their particular business area and that they're paying attention and that they become, I don't want to say the police, but that they become the people that go after the people who are not compliant. It's not so much us. We're reporting the data, but you have them go after their own team to say, hey, you didn't submit your timesheets. Hey, you haven't published your schedules, et cetera. And then also, we do report up once a month to the leaders, right? So they get a prettier version that shows whether or not their team is compliant. And many of them, the ones who especially care, are actually making that part of the reviews for their own team, the evaluations. Um, so let's talk lessons learned. Probably a lot of this has already come out, but again, certainly if you have questions, let me know. You have to think about process. Don't underestimate the amount of time that it takes to think about it. In our case, we even started with definitions. Um, it seems so simple, but if you ask people what a project is and what a program is, you probably will get different definitions. And so we actually defined uh, terms. We developed uh, process uh, definitions such as time tracking policies, capitalization policies, and you know those were published and people knew where to go and read them and understand them. So we didn't just say, here it is. Um, we talked about deployment coordinators, those subject matter experts that are out in the regions to make sure that people really get it and understand it and they can translate it to their world, their language, et cetera, their user community. Um, we did a lot of sharing of information. You can't move you know, such a big change in an organization without sharing what was coming, why it was coming, um, in many different forums. You know, everything from town halls to department meetings to one-on-ones to whatever it is we could think of. Deb, in particular, did tons of communication. So don't forget to have somebody accountable for that communication because it takes more time than you think about. Um, and we've already talked about leadership support. Uh, training. Um, not only do you have to think about how you're going to do your training, meaning, you know, is it role-based? Uh, how are you going to deliver it? You have to think about when you're going to do it. Uh, if you're in a global footprint, you're not going to be able just to do it once. You know, in North America time, you're probably going to have to do it at, you know, 10 p.m. Eastern time because you're talking around the globe. So just little logistics like that can, can take time and effort. Um, and then don't forget to rethink your training and your deployment after you do the first one or the first two. Um, in our case, we broke them into chunks of about five to 600 because it made logical business sense. And every time we did it, we refined our process a little bit. And so it's important that you learn from your own journey. Uh, we do have scheduled templates that are um, allocated to our projects based on the type of project it is. So if we have a, a strategic project that we know is going to be a deferred or a CapEx type project, we have a certain schedule that they get with, we have our cost category in there, you know, deferred, non-deferred kind of thing, and that's the schedule they get. If they have a small little support type project, they get a different schedule. So think about how you want to do that. Think about how you're going to administer the tool. Like, do you open it up so everybody and their brother can enter a new project, or do you control that a little bit? And if you're going to control it, in what ways are you going to control it? So. Just, you have to put a little thought into that kind of stuff. Um, environments. This is a pretty simple one, but if you don't stop and think about the overlapping aspects to your deployment, 
you could get yourself into trouble from an environment perspective. So in our case, I had a lot of grief from some of my own team because I said we needed a, a development environment, we needed a test environment, we needed a UAT environment, we needed a training environment, and a production environment. They're not all the same size, they're not all equal, but they were all available so that if we had to uh, be developing while we're doing some production adjustments or while we're training a whole bunch of people and they needed access to the training environment, we had those environments available. So don't underestimate thinking about your environments or the architecture. I talked early on about our pilot learning. Um, you know, they didn't plan for the architecture of a global scale, even for 600. They thought everything could be virtual, and that wasn't quite the case. And so um, when you think about it, you know, if you're going to work with a partner, bring in your partner, bring in your infrastructure team, bring in Microsoft. Have some time to actually review that architecture to make sure it makes sense not only for where you are today and where you're going to be by the end of the year, but where you think you're going, right? Because you don't want to have to reconfigure the whole thing as you grow. Um, I've probably covered most of these, but if you work in a global footprint, it is important to think about a lot of different things. Um, the HR legal aspect, uh, especially if you're working in Europe, uh, you need to think about European Works Council. If you're lucky enough to not know what that is, good for you. But if you are in Europe and you're going to do things like timesheets or you're going to do project status reporting that you know, could be considered as feeding to evaluations of your team, you have to include HR. You have to think legal. Um, in the case of timesheets, if you're going into LATAM in particular, you need to know that there are rules about how many hours people are legally allowed to work in a day, in a week. And one of the customizations that we had to develop was on our timesheets to satisfy our HR and legal requirements in that space. So again, if you don't do timesheets and you're not in LATAM, lucky you. But if you are, don't forget to think about that. Um, we've talked about the language packs, but in our case, we decided not to deploy language packs. Our project managers are required to communicate in English, um, at least if they're on a more global call. If they work in their local teams, certainly they can talk in their language. But in the tool, we only just employed um, English and the one thing that we did allow was for um, in LATAM in particular that community really wanted to be able to use Spanish so we said that in their schedules they could put non milestone tasks in Spanish if they wanted to although I don't think they do today but we did tell them they could but their milestone tasks that could be reported on a project status report had to be in English and so for us it's really important that we're going to be doing enterprise level portfolio reporting and you have to be able to put it in a language that the global footprint is going to understand. Um, let's see, I think we've covered training. Oh, I'm sorry, question? How do you use it? How can you report? OK. Um, financial, I think we've talked a little bit about it. One of the things, at the same time that we were deploying uh, EPM, our corporate platform team was deploying SAP globally. And so we knew that all of those regions were not on SAP. Um, so we had to enlist the support of finance to say, this is how we want it to be, not us, but sorry not us, but finance, needed to say, this is how the, the CapEx uh, project financial process will work. And even though you're not all on SAP yet, 
get ready because this is the way it's going to be. And so in our case, I don't think we would have been successful if we had tried to do that on our own from the PMO tools team. It needed to be finance telling the other finance leaders how it was going to work. We have, uh, what are they called, Andy, cost types? Cost and material resources in the tool, and some of our teams do that. We don't require them to do it, but we allow them and we have enabled that for them. Uh, not that part, no. It's basically the, the labor and the, the, you know, the project financial stuff. Um, so technology, we talked about our CIO. His famous question to us when we were starting up is, is the project manager in Vietnam going to have a good user experience? Is it going to be fast enough? So we centralized all of our architecture and our, our build, and it's all in North America in Cincinnati. And so his famous question is, you know, from a network perspective and from a functional, not functionality, from a infrastructure perspective, is it going to be robust enough for that PM in Vietnam? And so we actually did a lot of work with Microsoft where we actually simulated the, the bandwidth and we did some testing up front so that we could satisfy him because he would have never blessed us to go live in production if we couldn't verify that our, um, our infrastructure was going to be robust enough to support them. So again, don't forget it. Just because we're in North America, if you're working with those people in the remote countries, it's not all the same out there for them. Uh, I don't know the answer to that question. I can't hear you, Deb. But that's the, yeah, I would say more and less, right? Our, our, like our strategic projects are typically 12 to 15 months. Um, they can go longer, uh, but that we try to have smaller deliverables. So 12 to 15 months for those strategic toll gate type projects. A lot of our, you know, probably 600 of them are more in the three to six month range. And then the one thing I don't think I've mentioned is because we do time tracking, our resources, our team members are required to have 100% um, of their time in the tool. So we had to also come up with a terminology and a way that if they're working on support tasks, that they could also track their time for that. So the term we came up with was a non-scheduled driven work effort and they can make it January to December, and then if they've got people, you know, if Deb's working on the support task, she just charges her time in that way. So that looks like a project in the tool, but it's slightly different from a, you know, company perspective. Yes? Yeah, so actually, under the advice of UMT, we did not try to do an automatic interface through today, right? So we started in late 2009 and through today, it's only we, we do an extract, we have some you know, logic that finance provided, we run that extract, we have the output, and then we feed that to accounting and they use it in their process. Um, we probably could, but like I said, they were still deploying SAP globally and it was probably too much for our company to absorb. I think over time we might get there, but we're not there now. Extract to Excel, uh, yeah, these are like Excel extracts, yeah. But there's actually logic behind them because we have to prorate time and put it to the right projects and all that stuff. Yes? Um, I w I, I'd be curious how Deb would respond. I think our answer would be we would like to get there. but. As I mentioned, our company has some other processes. Um, you know, they have an annual op plan where the leaders go off and come up with their key strategic projects, and that's all done well outside of the tool. So I don't know if we'll ever get there in all honesty. We'd like to. We know the tool has functionality to make us more effective in how we do that, but right now it's uh, more at the senior manager level. Now, the one thing I haven't mentioned is we have different processes. So we have that strategic toll gate um, kind of project and those are the ones that are typically being defined by our senior management team. 
We have smaller work that we call job jar work, which is, you know, um, like quarterly kind of maintenance work. Those are actually enabled more fully in the tool. Um, but the, the larger strategic ones are still not picked using, you know, the strategic drivers in the tool. They're used or selected elsewhere. Somebody else had a question? Yes. You know, I was just thinking if somebody would ask me that. Um, so uh, across the time, like we had at 1.3 maybe UMT resources helping us. We are a big um, TCS Tata shop, so we literally we have no developers on our team. It's only our TCS team, and right now we have a couple of developers, a couple of tests. Um, I have SMEs who are more business leaders. I have probably three or four of those, so it's not a huge team. Um, and then we have a group of what we call the admin team. They're more like hourly workers who help us, you know, answer tickets and first level support type stuff. So I don't know. Okay. Um, the one other thing, and hopefully we're way past this, but again, four or five years ago, we actually even had to worry about PC status globally, right? Not everybody has a basic computer. And so we actually had to do, I think we call it an inventory. We actually had like a little script that would run out to their PC and check, you know, the basics that we needed in their computer to make sure that they were going to have a successful experience on the PC. So again, it sounds so basic, but when you're working globally, it may not always be true. Um, so in summary, I think our value has continued to grow. The one thing that is true is that the more you use the tool, the more people realize that you have it and the more value you can bring to the company. We have leaders come to us all the time and have you know, really important questions that they need us to answer. And we also have basic processes that we now support and enable from the tool. Um, we talked about knowing all of our people and all of our projects. Certainly, you know, that's a big check. We're able to do that now. Um, we have a process for consistently managing our project financials. We have helped, not alone with the tool, but certainly we have enabled our say-do ratio, which is our delivery of our projects, to increase. We're about at a 99% rate, which is pretty darn high. And that's not only from the technology side, but it's also if uh, operations or the marketing teams have to do you know, launches on their side of marketing materials, et cetera. It's the total say-do to the customer. So a 99% is very, very high. Um, we have a lot of reporting that we enable from the tool. We have portfolio scorecards, project status. Um, at the back, I did put an example in this deck of the project status report that we enabled. Uh, with the help of UMT, we pull a lot of the data from uh, EPM and project server, and we can produce a status report that shows you know, the name and all the basics and milestones, issues, risks, and financials. And not only can we do that, but we actually put it in a PowerPoint format because our company manages by PowerPoint. So that was very, very important and that's something that we've been able to uh, support from the tool. Um, the one thing that I haven't mentioned is the fact that um, in addition to using EPM for timesheets of our consultants, we also have been able to take that data and validate it against their invoices. So when we have, you know, 50% plus of our staff is consultants where we're getting consultant invoices. We needed to make sure that those invoices were accurate. They were charging to the right projects and not only to the right projects but to the right task level so that our, our uh, deferred status would be correct. And so what we realized is we have all this data. Why are we getting you know, not accurate invoices? We could actually marry the two and make sure that the invoices are accurate. And so that is a, a month in, month out process that we do to manage millions and millions of dollars of consultant invoices to make sure that they're accurate. Uh, no, we actually get uh, feeds from their system and from ours and uh, we marry it. Um, so I think we've covered all of this, but we have succeeded in moving to one tool. The 35 business units that we had, we still have them, but they all now use one tool to manage their projects and their people. We um, are supporting currently 4,400 users, uh, 400, 350 somewhere in their project managers. Um, we are expanding right now. 
um, to a new business that we just acquired, our Nielsen Audio business. Um, that will increase our user base, and we're actually, Deb is working on an integration with operations, as I mentioned. So by the end of the year, we expect to be about 5,000 uh, users, and we will be beyond just engineering and technology. We will have operations. And I forgot who asked about the question about um, portfolio selection, but the operations team actually does want to do that, and Deb is actually working with them to enable that right now. Um, the timesheet compliance, Andy mentioned that, but we have 95% timesheet compliance. Um, we require timesheets to be submitted weekly, and then they are um, kind of frozen at that monthly boundary when we actually send that data up to accounting. We don't go back. You know, despite what anybody says, I made a mistake, well, too bad, so sad. Go talk to accounting and do a reclass because our timesheets are our timesheets. We are SOX compliant, and it is what it is, and that's the way it stays. Um, and the SOX compliant, because we feed our project financials, we have to be. So we had to think about all the requirements of being SOX compliant and you know, tracking changes and who touches what environments. And so if you need to do that because you're going to do project financial support out of the tool, don't forget to think about those requirements. Uh, governance, um, you know, we have governance. We have those governance leads who look at our data and who make sure that it looks right for their business unit's perspective. We also have been able to find people doing things that they shouldn't be doing. You know, they'll put in a toll gate project we didn't know about. There was no governance going to be provided from the PMO. So we find those things much more visibly and much more quickly as a result of having everything in one space. Um, and lastly, the project management skills. Have we improved them? Absolutely. Are they perfect? Absolutely not. But people are definitely smarter. They're wiser. They know how to think about things. They, they manage issues. They manage risks. They're visible, and they are reported to their leaders, and so they're stronger in many, many ways as a result of this whole journey. So where are we now? Um, I've already mentioned that we are planning to upgrade to 2013. We've already done our proof of concept. Um, Hans actually has been to our site and actually taken our 2010 data, run it through the entire upgrade process so we know what that is going to look like. We're prepared for that. We are looking at all of our customizations and getting ready to address how we're going to handle that. At the same time that we're parallel working on what the operational workflows and governance and metadata is going to be in the tool so that we can get several hundred of them launched in the next couple months with a larger footprint by the end of the year. Um, so I think I would say, uh, well, we've talked about Project Online. Um, Project Online is certainly a viable solution. We need to look at it from a lot of different angles, not only financially, but functionality, and you know when is the right time for us, because it will be an undertaking. It's not something that we can just kind of push a button and make it happen. We're going to have to plan it out as a real project. So being the project people, we can't just like say we're going to do it. We have to really plan it and do it well. So that is something that we're planning to work on. Um, we've talked to Microsoft. We've had a, a few good discussions. We have identified some of the considerations for our team, and we will be continuing to work on that in the second half of this year. So with that, uh, we put the iPad in there because, again, one of our big complaints from our CTO was that version 2010 would not allow him to approve timesheets on his iPad. So when we go to 13, that guy is going to be able to approve his darn timesheets on the iPad. So with that, I would say we have had um, a pretty fast-paced journey. Um, we've certainly achieved a lot of benefit by going to the tool. We've certainly learned a lot of things that we would not do in the same way again and others that we do as we execute the next project. So hopefully some of these lessons can uh, apply and, and help you in your journey. And if you have any other questions, Deb and Andy and I are here to help. Yes? It's Microsoft Project Server. We just happen to call it EPM. So it's Microsoft Project Server. We use PWA. We use Microsoft Project Pro. And we definitely use the base tool, right? It's been configured, but we use the base tool for all of its functionality. But then we've added in a few customizations, like the, the information on the timesheet that we have to display. Um, the other thing I would say is we have a lot of custom fields. We're a data company. So if you ask our UMT, 
guys, they'll say, oh my goodness, how much data that you're trying to capture, not only about people, but about projects. So we have a lot of custom fields. Um, but it's basically the basic tool, right? Uh, Andy, I don't know if there's more you wanted to add there. Yeah, the way we're going to, um, let me just add there, the way we're going to um, continue to use um, 360 is um, the support cost on our toll gate projects. So these strategic projects, when they go through the, the SDLC, there are certain points in time where they estimate ongoing support costs. And so they go through an approval process and they get approved, but then when it's time for budget, people just forgot that all of that funding was supposedly approved for next year's budget. And so one of the key things we want to do is track that so we can keep it in front of them on a monthly or quarterly basis to say, don't forget, you've been approving these 10, 12, 20 toll gate programs, and that's going to add, you know, three million bucks next year that you're not planning for. So that's one of the ways that we're going to plan to use that. You had a question? Yeah, so finance is the one who provides our currency. Our, we, again, we have a blended rate by country. It's provided by finance, and they do it looking at real salary rates. And this is for employees or FTEs. For consultants, we use the contractor rate, or the contract rate, in U.S. dollars. So it's, the finance converts it all into the equivalent U.S. dollars, and that's what we put into the tool. But it is based on, for employees, it's based on the salaries in that country and finance calculates it, and then they provide it to us. Like, we don't enter a rate unless finance provided it to us. But the consultants, which we have a lot of, we have what we call high-priced consultants, and we have our, our, you know, our primary vendor, and those are the contract rates that we pay for them so that those costs will be more accurate. Yes? Uh-huh. You know, we have a lot of data, right? So we have, one thing I didn't mention here, actually I'll just say, one thing I did not mention is don't forget to think about your data archival or data retention policy. You know, when you first launch your first year, you don't think about that. Well, especially with timesheets, you know, we have like 200,000 timesheets a year. So you have to think about the impact of your data. And so um, we have a lot of data and we did start to experience some performance concerns. Um, we have actually since addressed them by partnering with Microsoft and or UMT. Um, but still, uh, we actually had Sajin, who presented this morning, come to our company and talk to us about 13 and what it was going to do. And uh, performance is one of the key benefits in 13 beyond some of the functionality um, enhancements. So that is why we were interested. Um, it's not that it was horrible, but we knew it could be better, and it was starting to go down. So we actually run you know, things that we can control, we run our data archival retention, whatever we want to call it, uh, process annually, uh, right about this time of year where we go and pull off old data. Um, but then we continue to work with Microsoft to find you know, where we see issues, we report them, and we work with them to get solutions. But 13, um, from our testing, um, generally was better. There were a couple things we even shared with them, but generally it's looking strong. So the, the only ones that the question is Project Pro versus PWA. And PWA is all 43, 4400. They all have PWA. Um, and that's where you know, their issues, their risks, their timesheets, all that is in there. The only ones who have Pro are the PMs who actually have to manage schedules. So one of the big things for us is just because you have a title called Project Manager, you don't get Pro, right? If you're not going to be the one managing a schedule in Pro, then you're not going to get pro because it's expensive, right? So go buy a different license, but you're not going to get pro. Okay. Any other questions? You know, I did put one in here. It's not a very clear copy, and it's about five years old. Uh, oh, maybe it got taken out. Is it? So this is like one of the prototypes. You can see it's like back from 2010, but this is literally all data 
from Microsoft Project, and it's consolidated into this sort of one-page view. It can run into two pages, but it's all consolidated into a one-page view that then we use, I think it's Dispose or something, and it creates the PowerPoint format, and then they can just plop it into PowerPoint and put it in a full deck for all of their projects. So that's an example of what we've done. So it's got your, your cost, it's got, you know, we, this plan ahead and accomplishments, those are just, um, uh, what do you call them, like lists in SharePoint where they can actually enter that data and then it pulls it right into this report. Anything else, Randy, is there anything? Does anybody, how many of you are actually global kind of footprints? It's a, it's a different world, right? It's like if you're just working in North America, it's different. <laughs> It's just different. Do, do you guys have anything else you would share for everybody else? I don't know. Any other lessons from a global footprint? Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We, um, Deb just recently launched an enterprise requirements tool for us. And uh, that was one of the approaches that we've taken, and we're finding it to be very helpful. So, yeah, thanks for sharing that. Anybody else have anything else you want to share? I mean, you went from 10 to 13? Mm -hmm. Yep. That's a good thing. Yeah. It is. It's keeping those techie people happy. Hmm? The email slide? Oh, okay, sure. So Andy reminded me that I forgot to mention our contact names. Uh, Deb, myself, Andy, Oscar, um, we would be more than happy to talk to any of you and share even more detail than what we have here, or maybe you have some good stuff to share with us. We'd be delighted to talk to you. So uh, I think with, unless there are any other questions, I would like to say thank you very much and hope you have a great meeting, conference. Just